Good morning, Woodlands Church. Would you get up on your feet? Let's praise the Lord this morning. Come on. my heart. Your presence is never out of reach. You're all around me. No matter how far I try to run, I always run straight into your love. How could I not fall to my knees and tell you you're worthy? I sing you I'm yours Forever I surrender all my heart I see now you love me from the start I won't forget the faithful God you are I'm confident, I'm confident in your grace upon grace upon grace you
circumstances, his grace is always sufficient. Found in every turn. Grace in the deepest valley. Grace when the night is long. Grace found in every season. Grace has the final word.
mighty river come and fill me again come and fill me again come and fill me Good morning, Woodlands Church. We're so glad that you're here with us. Turn around and say hello to somebody next to you. Sound good morning. Happy 4th of July weekend. Come on, you may be seated. Something great about the opportunity we have to worship freely together um, as you celebrate 4th of July on Tuesday, even just all weekend, um, to take a moment and pause and remember uh, what a great privilege that is to be able to have that freedom to worship freely uh, in this place. And so we are so grateful for that. Well, my name is Chris Van Houten. I'm our lead pastor of Life Groups, and I want to lead you into our time of giving. And there's a verse I want to start us off with, which is actually the beginning of tithing, like the very first tithe. And if you're wondering like, oh yeah, I wonder where that came from. Yeah, here's where, here's where it begins. So Genesis 14, verse 19 and 20, it says this, it says, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, who becomes Abraham soon, by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And so Abraham, or Abram, gave him a tenth of everything. So this was actually a priest that was giving a blessing to Abraham. He's literally blessing him and saying, you have been righteous, you have been faithful, let me bless you. And in response, Abraham actually gives the tithe. What's crazy to me is what happens after that. Because what happens after that is the reason that Jesus came and died and rose again. God makes a covenant, a promise with Abraham that then is fulfilled only through Jesus. That everything that we know about church and why we exist and why we're here together worshiping and praising God is because of this moment. It starts by one, Abraham choosing to seek the Lord and the two things that go hand in hand, obedience and blessing, always. I mean, everything in our faith comes from a, whether in this moment, what's so incredible to me is that God actually blesses first and then Abraham follows in obedience. So whether we start with obedience and then end up in blessing or whether we are blessed and we follow in obedience, they are meant to go hand in hand. They were never meant to be one without the other. And what I love is he invites us into this opportunity to follow a command, an actual law that was then put into practice in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It goes throughout the rest of the Bible of bringing forth our first and our best to the Lord and saying, God, this is yours. We commit it to you. And so as you give, there's many ways to give here at Woodlands Church. You can give on your phone. You can pull up the Woodlands Church app. You can download that and then go to the giving banner on that, or you can go to a, the website, wc.org, and then either select the giving banner or go to wc.org slash give. Um, once you select that giving banner, it will take you to our push pay flat platform. That's a secure giving site. That then allows you not only to set up reoccurring giving and what that means to give the tithe, the 10%, that first and the best to the Lord, um, or a one-time gift, but we'd encourage you to do what the Bible commands us to do, and that is to tithe. Um, But then if you need further instructions, you can text GiveWC one word to 77977, or if you have stocks or assets, you can go to wc.org slash stock. But the, the heart behind this is that in the beginning, there was blessing, and God said, this is good, and so then we follow in obedience. And so in this moment, if you've never tithed, challenging you, be obedient. Watch what God does. He's so faithful and so good. Let's pray over our time of giving together. God, thank you for your blessings. Your blessings are so good, and we are so grateful for every one of them. And so God, as we give right now the tithe, we give our first and our best to you. God, we just pray that you would use it for your kingdom, for your glory, that your name would be lifted high. We love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our ushers are going to come forward right now where you can actually give cash or check in the baskets if you would like. Um, But I have some announcements for you that I want to make sure that you know about because this summer has been absolutely amazing. Um, In the last three weeks, we've seen just under 1,200 people get baptized. It's literally at 1,199. And in our last three camps, our kids camp, 
our junior high camp and our high school camp, 533 students and kids have committed their life to the Lord. Come on, that's amazing. I mean, what God is doing in a summer is unheard of. I mean, it's so awesome to see the life change that is happening. So I tell you this because one, it's incredible and we should celebrate and we should praise God for that. But two, I will wanna remind you that the summer is not over. We actually have a VBS, a Vacation Bible School, which is for preschoolers age four through fifth grade. And I'm telling you, this is one of the most influential opportunities you will have to share the hope that we have in Christ with your neighbors, with your friends, because inviting your neighbor and their family to go to Beach Week in Florida is a big ask. But inviting your neighbor to bring their kids to the church for VBS is not a big ask, right? And so your kids not only need to be here for VBS because that's laying a healthy foundation in the Lord. It's such an incredible time. They have so much fun. There's water slides, there's games, there's activities, but they hear the gospel. They hear the truth of who Jesus is and it is so important. And so I'm telling you, sign your kids up. Four-year-old to fifth grade, make sure they're here. July 17th through the 20th. Now. If you're hearing this and you're like, well, I want my kid to be here, or maybe my kid's already signed up, your kid has friends and they need to be here because as every parent knows, you want your kid to be surrounded by other people that know the Lord or at least have a, uh, a healthy conviction of the Holy Spirit as they make decisions in life, right? Like I think we all desire and pray for that as parents. So make sure your kids are not only inviting their friends or you invite your neighbors so that their kids can come, but what an easy and awesome opportunity to invite others to be a part. And last, we need you to serve. Because I'm telling you, with 1,300 kids already signed up, we are never going to be able to handle the influx of what comes after that. Because I'm telling you, I'm not gonna be surprised when we hear that we had close to 2,000 kids come to VBS this year, which means we need all of you. We need you to serve, for, it's, it's from nine till noon. So you can take a half day, you can take it. I mean, you, if you work remote, you could work from home the rest of the, I don't know, maybe you, you if you can't do that, I don't know. I'm just making up stuff. This sounds really good. Come be a part, right? So come serve with us. We need you. I'm telling you, it's an incredible experience. You'll be blessed by it. Uh, against obedience and blessing, they go together. So come be a part of that. And this weekend, Pastor Lee Strobel starts a brand new series that's gonna be a two-week series all about doubt. And so the question we're posing this week that Pastor Lee Strobel will help guide us into is if I believe, why do I still doubt? And he's the right person to be leading us through that. He's incredible. So if you would stand on up, we're going to continue to worship together and get our hearts ready for this message.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are great, that you are real, that you are powerful, that you're compassionate, that you're forgiving, that you're infinite, that you're eternal. We praise you for that, and, and we admit that we're not. I mean, we're, we're finite. We don't understand all that you understand. We don't see all that you see. And sometimes that leads to doubts that we have because we just don't have your perspective. And so I pray that uh, this series that we're embarking upon will be an encouragement to those who have questions or doubts in their, in their spirit and that you will lead us to a, a firmer and a stronger and a more vibrant faith as a result. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, I remember when I was a new Christian, I volunteered at the church I was attending in Chicago. And my role as a volunteer was to respond to cards that people would submit at the services with questions that they would have. So that we, everybody got a bulletin when they came in and had a tear-off card. And if you had a question or wanted to be contacted by the church, you kind of fill that out and put it in the offering plate. So one day, I'm part of the team that gets these cards to respond. And one of them was from a 12-year-old girl. And the card simply said, I'd like to know more about Jesus. And I thought, oh, this is great. This is awesome. So her phone number was there. I called her up. She said, yeah, you know, she said, I live with my dad. And I'm wondering, would you and your wife be willing to come over to our apartment on uh, Friday night and have dinner and tell us about Jesus? I thought, well, of course. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. So I hung up the phone. I told Leslie, I said, oh, this is going to be awesome. This, I, oh, this is so cute. And she's so open to God. This is going to be wonderful. So we drive over to their apartment on that Friday night. And her father answers the door. And as we walk into the apartment, I see on the coffee table a stack of these heavy-duty academic, scholarly books attacking Christianity. Turned out her dad was a scientist, and he'd spent the previous three years reading all of these uh, heavy-duty tomes attacking the Christian faith. And so we sat down to have dinner, and we had pizza and, and soft drinks for several hours, and the whole time he's peppering me with the toughest objections and questions about the faith that I have ever heard. Now, I did a lot of research before I became a Christian. I was able to answer many of his questions, but a lot of them, I had no idea how to respond to what he was asking. And after a while, I, had to, I started to experience what I call uh, spiritual vertigo. You know, that's that sense of dizziness and disorientation that you get when someone challenges the core of your faith in a way that you, you can't even respond to. You feel like they're kicking the legs out of what you believe. And I felt like all of a sudden I wasn't standing on a solid foundation of truth. I was sinking in the quicksand of doubt. Have you ever experienced spiritual vertigo? Have you ever been pestered by doubts about your faith? Have you ever been challenged by someone who raises an objection to Christianity that you have no idea how to address? You know, we live in an increasingly skeptical culture, and the chances are at some time, at some point, somebody may very well challenge you on why you believe what you believe. I was communicating with a guy online who said his granddaughter, who was six years old, um, was a kindergarten student at a public school, and on the playground, the other students were mocking her and making fun of her because she believes in God. Oh, you believe in fairy tales. You believe in God. I mean, even our grandkids are getting challenged by people, and the result might be that doubts begin to creep in. Questions begin to erode our faith, and that's what I want to talk about in this little two-week mini-series called, If I Believe, and Why Do I Have Doubts? Well, I'll finish the story about me and the scientist a little later in my talk. But first, I want to deal with three common misconceptions about doubt. The first misconception is this. You may think that doubt is the opposite of faith, but it's not. It's not. The opposite of faith is unbelief. And there's an important distinction between unbelief and doubt. 
Unbelief generally in the Bible is a willful refusal to believe or a deliberate decision to disobey God. But that's not doubt. To doubt is to be indecisive or ambivalent over an issue. It's where you're hung up between certainty and uncertainty. You haven't come down squarely on the side of disbelief. You're kind of up in the air about something. You've got questions or concerns about some aspect of the faith. Friends, listen, you can have a strong faith and still have some questions, right? You can be heaven bound and still express uncertainty over certain theological issues. You can be a full-fledged Christian without having to feel like every single question of life has been absolutely settled. In fact, it's been said that struggling with God over the issues of life doesn't show a lack of faith. That is faith. I mean, just read the Psalms, right? The second misconception is that some people think that doubt is unforgivable, but it's not. It's not. God does not condemn us when we come to him with sincere questions or doubts about the faith. You can see that in John the Baptist. I mean, if anybody should have understood the identity of Jesus being the unique son of God, it was John the Baptist. He once pointed to Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He baptized Jesus. He saw the heavens open up. He heard the voice of the Father saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. John the Baptist once pointed to Jesus and said, I have seen and I testify this is the son of God. But then what happens? He gets arrested. He gets thrown in prison. Question, what happens to a lot of us when tough times come? Doubts begin to creep in, don't they? Spiritual vertigo starts to take hold, doesn't it? And so that's what happens to John. He's in prison. Now he's not so sure anymore about the identity of Jesus. He's wondering, dare I even suggest he has some doubts about it? But what does he do? Does he just wallow in that? Does he allow that doubt to just erode his soul? No. He gets a couple friends together. He says, look, go track down Jesus and ask him point blank, once and for all, are you the one we've been waiting for or are we to wait for somebody else? So his buddies track down Jesus. Hey, Jesus, you know John. Well, he got busted. And now he's freaking out. So would you just tell us once and for all, point blank, are you the one? We've been waiting for or we to wait for somebody else. Now, here's the deal. How does Jesus react to John expressing this doubt and this question? Does he get angry? Does he say, how dare John, of all people, have the temerity to express a hesitation about my identity? No. He says to those followers of John in Luke 7, verse 22, quote, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. In other words, go back to John. Tell about the evidence you've seen with your own eyes that convinces you that I am the one I claim to be. So they go back and they tell John, but here's the deal. Has this now disqualified John from any role in the kingdom of God because he dared to ask a question? No. It's after this incident that Jesus gets up before a group and he says, among those born of women, there's no one greater than John. John, the guy who dared to ask a question. Friends, it is okay for you to ask questions. It's even okay for you to have some doubts. As long as you do what John did and you pursue answers. But God's not going to slam dunk you if you come to him with sincere questions or doubts. I mean, don't you think God would rather have an honest relationship with you? He already knows what's in your heart. You're not telling him anything new. Don't you think he would rather have you be honest about where you're at so that you could connect on a sincere and honest level? And so doubt by itself isn't unforgivable. And third, you may think doubt is unhealthy, but it's not always unhealthy. The truth is there can be an upside to doubt. It's like getting an immunization, a vaccine. I don't know how they work these days, but back when I was a kid and we'd get these immunizations, the way they would work is in order to fight off a future disease, the doctors would inject you with a small amount of that very same disease so that your body would build up antibodies and that would battle off the disease if you were ever exposed to it. 
your body actually is stronger because it's been exposed to the initial injection of a little bit of that very disease that you may ultimately confront. Well, when we're infected with the virus of doubt and we seek answers to our questions, we can emerge stronger than ever in our faith because our faith has been confirmed once more. And that gives us new confidence in dealing with other objections that may arise in the future. So how does the virus of doubt infect us? Uh, how, how, how does doubt enter into our lives? There's three ways, really, three pathways that doubt comes into our soul. Through our minds, through our emotions, and through our will. So first, doubt can enter through our mind, through our mind. This is where we come up with intellectual questions or objections to the faith, where we begin wondering if things like Satan and angels and miracles and heaven and hell are really rational for us to believe in. Doubts develop in our minds when we don't really know why we believe what we believe. You know, it's been said that Christians should believe simply, that is, to have the faith of a child. But we shouldn't just simply believe. Chances are that someone, sometime, somewhere, is going to challenge you with your faith. And not knowing why you believe what you believe is what makes you vulnerable to developing doubts. And not only can doubt breed in our minds, but it can also breed through our emotions. Through our emotions. In other words, some people have a faith that is built on feelings. They, they, they had an, a, a euphoric emotional experience when they came to faith in Christ, and, and they were pumped up for a period of time. But eventually that spiritual high begins to wear off, and they start wondering whether their faith is slipping or whether or not they're really a Christian at all. They've misunderstood the role of emotions versus the role of faith. Faith is not fundamentally a feeling. It is a decision of the will to follow Jesus Christ. And it doesn't ebb and flow depending on how emotionally pumped up that we are. Others have personalities that are more susceptible than others to mood swings or to depression. And people find when they're emotionally down, that's when doubts tend to creep in. In fact, just like some people are susceptible to certain diseases more than others, people who have a melancholy sort of personality, they're especially vulnerable to doubt because they kind of take a, a questioning and a contemplative approach to life. Nothing wrong with that. That's just a personality type. But to be aware that if you have kind of a, a melancholy personality, you kind of question a lot of things anyway, and, and, and you uh, kind of go through a, a contemplative way of viewing the world, you may be more susceptible than others to doubt. Doubt can also develop in our emotions among people who are emotionally scarred from their past. In other words, if you suffered abuse from your dad when you were growing up, or if you were abandoned by your father when you were growing up, or if you felt unloved or unworthy of your dad as you were growing up, that can affect the way that you interact with God. I mean, you may develop chronic doubts and uncertainties because deep down, you kind of keep your heavenly father at an arm's length because you're afraid your heavenly father is going to ultimately disappoint you and hurt you the way that your earthly father did. In fact, Dr. Paul Vitz, who's a psychologist at New York University, a uh, professor there, uh, did an in-depth study of all the famous atheists of history. Camus, Sartre, Nietzsche, Freud, Voltaire, Wells, Feuerbach, O'Hare, all of them. And what he discovered is in virtually every case, their father either abandoned their family when they were young, divorced their mother when they were young, died when they were young, or with whom they had a very difficult relationship with their dad. And the implication is, if your earthly father has disappointed you or hurt you, you don't want to really know a heavenly father. And so often you develop or you manufacture, create doubts to, to keep him at arm's length because you don't want him to disappoint you like your earthly father did. And this is, this is a, a real phenomenon. Uh, I, I, I experienced it in my own life. I had a very difficult relationship with my dad. And you know, I became an atheist as a young man for a lot of reasons. 
And I think one of those reasons was this father wound, as psychologists call it, this, this sense that I don't, I don't want there to be a heavenly father if, my, if he's going to disappoint me like my earthly father. So it can develop, doubt can develop through our minds, through our emotions, but it can also enter into us through our will, through our will. This is where we make choices. This is where we make decisions. In other words, doubts can multiply when Christians make a willful decision to continue a pattern of sin in their life. They're involved with, with certain sin in their life. They don't want to give it up. They, they cling to it. And sin creates a lack of peace. And it creates a sense of being separated from God, a, a sense. That we, in fact, we don't want to relate closely to God. Why? Because we feel convicted about this pattern of sin in our life. And so when a person can't find peace, he wonders why God isn't comforting him. And when he feels like God is distant, he begins to wonder if God is there at all. When in reality, the underlying cause of his doubt is his own willful decision to cling to sin. Or doubt can enter into a person when they realize that the Bible contradicts their political ideology. In other words, they take a position on a social issue, for instance, and then as they study more in Scripture, they realize that Jesus takes the opposite position. And instead of choosing to continue to follow Jesus, the person manufactures reasons to doubt the veracity of Christianity so they can keep their political ideology intact. So those are just a few of the ways that doubt can enter into our lives, through our minds, through our emotions, through our will. But it is imperative that we do something about it when it begins to take hold. Because if we don't, yes, doubt can begin to erode our souls. But there are steps that we can take, and I've found five steps in my life that I've taken when doubts have started to get a foothold into my life, five steps that I've found, because they're biblical, really make a difference. And so to make these five steps easy to remember, I'm going to take the word faith, faith, and use each letter as the beginning of each step. So for example, the F in faith stands for this first step, find the root of your doubt. Find the root of your doubt. In other words, you need to diagnose the source of your doubt before you can really come to grips with it. I've just gone through some examples of how doubt can infect us through our minds and our emotions and our will. And maybe as I was going through that, you're going, yeah, I, I see how that might be the case in, in my situation. You know, um, maybe there is a pattern of sin in my life and I'm clinging to that and I don't want to give it up. And it's created this feeling of distance between me and God, and that's where this doubt is coming from. Maybe that's there. Maybe, maybe it's some emotional issue from your childhood that's affecting it, or maybe just some intellectual question that you've heard or been challenged by. But try to identify which one of these three pathways is the one by which doubt has entered into your life. Then the A in faith stands for this step. Ask God and others for help. Ask God and others for help. Be as honest with God as the demon-possessed father did. Uh, actually, he had a demon-possessed boy. And uh, the father says in Mark 9, verse 24 to Jesus, he says, I do believe, help my unbelief. I do believe, help my unbelief. You know, it's, it's not out of bounds if you're wrestling with doubts and questions in your mind to go to God and to ask him to bolster your faith. James 4, verse 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. And so we need to turn to God and ask him to give you the answers to satisfy your soul, to give you wisdom, to give you confidence, to give you a pathway to deal with the doubt that is starting to affect you. you know, as I said, God's not going to be angry when you come to him with the doubt. He's not going to be surprised. In fact, he'll, I, I think he'll greet this with um, with a sense of, of, of joy, that you're honest enough to express it to him and not to paper it over and pretend like everything's always great. And then turn to mature Christians in your life and ask for their help as well. Let them encourage you. Let them pray for you. Because James 5.16 says we should honestly admit our struggles to each other and pray for each other. Why? So the verse says, we may be healed. Now, I know sometimes it can be hard to go to another 
member of the church or, or a pastor at the church or something and, and be honest enough to talk about the questions or doubts that you have. But nobody's going to judge you for that. Um, we all have questions from time to time. Nothing wrong with that. It's part of life. It's part of faith. It's part of human nature. It's part of how God wired us up. And so we ought to feel like it's okay to come and to express hesitations about certain aspects of what we believe. Then the I in faith stands for this. Identify a course of treatment. Identify a course of treatment. Now that you've found the root cause of your doubt and you're seeking God's help and you're seeking the help of other Christians, what plan are you going to implement to deal with those doubts? For instance, let's say it's a doubt that is uh, entered into your mind. It's an, it's an intellectual question about some theological thicket that you find yourself lost in. Um, instead of just having this vague sense of, oh, I'm not sure about this, get really specific. Take a piece of paper, take a pen, and write down, distill down. These are the three specific questions that are hanging me up. Be as specific as you can because it's a lot easier to find answers when you're being specific rather than just being vague. Um, and there are a lot of satisfying answers out there, a lot more resources these days than back in the day when I was talking to that scientist. Our bookstores got many of them. You can go, you can find answers to satisfy your heart and soul. If you're realizing it's an emotional issue that might, might be generating these doubts, you know, it may be time to see a Christian counselor. Nothing to be ashamed of with that. I see a Christian counselor. I go to a guy who's a PhD in psychology, and we get together from time to time, and we sit down, and I can be completely honest with him, and he can be completely honest with me. He can draw with his, from his theological training and his biblical knowledge and his psychological training and, and provide insights that I found very helpful uh, over many years. So you know, I do this, and there's nothing to be ashamed of to say, you know what, I would like to sit down with a qualified counselor and really wrestle through something like this. And if it's a doubt that you think may be stemming from a difficult relationship that you had with your dad, there's a solution for this. C.S. Lewis talked about it. I found it very helpful in my own life. Here's the solution. If your dad has disappointed you or hurt you or abused you or whatever, and you believe it's what's introducing doubts into your mind about whether there's a heavenly father, imagine what the perfect father would be like. What would the perfect father be like? Oh, he'd be, he'd be kind, he'd be gentle, he'd be warm, he'd be compassionate, he'd be your biggest cheerleader, he'd bring you up into his lap and give you a hug. Friends, that is a picture of your heavenly father. Our Heavenly Father is not just a magnified version of our earthly father. He is wholly different. And when we come to the realization he is the perfect father that all of us long to have, that often can help deal with the emotional questions and doubts that are entering into your soul. Or if doubt is entering into your life because of a decision that you make, a decision of your will, Think about, where am I specifically holding back from God? Where am I holding back? Where am I refusing to follow him? Where am I making the decision to choose my way over God's ways? I mean, you know, the truth is you can be um, in a situation where you let disobedience or pride plague you with doubts for the rest of your life, or you could submit your entire life to God and really experience the adventure of the Christian life. So that's F-A-I. The T in faith stands for take care of your spiritual health. Take care of your spiritual health. You know, a body is less susceptible to a virus when it's healthy, right? And strong bodies, they can fight off minor infections before they become serious and life-threatening. And a spiritually strong faith is better able to ward off the virus of doubt when it begins to threaten your life. So just like a body is strengthened through good nourishment and exercise, build up your faith through both knowledge and action. By knowledge, I mean to really do some studying, do some learning about why you believe what you believe. What is the evidence that points toward the truth of the Christian faith? 
um, to be able to read systematically through the Bible, uh, to attend church on a regular basis, to get a, a regular diet, a well-balanced understanding of who God is and why it makes sense to follow him, to really become educated on, on why it is you believe what you believe. And then through your day-to-day -day actions, to build your faith by exercising it. You know, we learn best by doing, right? We learn best by doing. And we learn best about the trustworthiness of God when we make the daily decision to submit to him and to press the envelope of our faith. To do what King David said, to taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you do those things, listen to what happens. When doubt hits, it's much easier to look back on the knowledge you have about him and your personal experience with him and to say, look, I may not know the answer to this particular question yet, but I've got plenty of evidence that God is real, plenty of evidence that the Bible is reliable, plenty of personal experience that God cares about me. And all of this gives me confidence that God has an answer for this question. So I'm not gonna panic. I'm not going to toss out my faith out the window. I'll keep trusting God because he has shown me in so many ways that he is trustworthy. That's why maintaining a strong spiritual health, using the spiritual practice of prayer and contemplation and Bible study and fellowship and so, to develop a strong faith that will ward off doubt when it threatens us. And then finally, the H in faith stands for this. Hold your remaining questions in tension. Hold your remaining questions in tension. What I mean by that is we are limited creatures with limited minds, and so we can't understand everything that an infinite God understands. We don't have the perspective that God has. We don't have the capacity to understand all that God understands, and so there are bound to be some questions that we have to wait to get a final answer on. Maybe as we mature in our faith over our lifetime, maybe an answer will become clear over time, but maybe we gotta wait until we get to heaven and we can raise our hands and say, hey, Jesus, yeah, I, I got a question. How does this predestination thing really fit into free will? I'm just curious. How does this Trinity thing really work, right? We'll be in heaven, we'll be, I'll, I'll have my hand up. We'll be asking all kinds of questions in heaven. And we got all of eternity to satisfy our curiosity. But until then, listen, until then, we can say, I may not have answers to every single one of my peripheral questions, but the answers that I do have point me unmistakably toward a God who is real, who is dependable, and a heavenly Father who loves me. And so my faith can stay intact while I hold some of these peripheral issues in abeyance. That's not ignoring your doubts. That's not suppressing your doubts. That's making an informed decision to suspend judgment for a while based on the facts that you do have. And after all, we don't have to know everything to know enough. And we have enough evidence to know that God is real, that he loves us, and he wants to adopt us as his children. So those are five steps we can take, F-A-I-T-H, to help us recover from a bout with doubt. And if you're struggling today with uncertainty, I hope this will kind of give you something that you can work through toward getting resolution. And as you do, remember, again, you don't have to be afraid of having questions. You don't have to panic because you've got some questions. God isn't panicking. There's no reason for you to panic. And you don't have to be embarrassed about bringing them up, especially in this church. So use your doubt as an impetus to grow stronger than ever in your faith. That's the upside of doubt. And that brings me to the rest of the story about that scientist and his 12-year-old daughter that we had dinner with all those many years ago. So here he is, he's, he's peppering me with these really difficult theological thickets and questions and conundrums and so. And, and finally, at the end of it, I said, sir, you've raised some really good questions. And I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know the answer to most of them. But I really don't think that you're the first person in 2,000 years 
to destroy Christianity. So let me do some research. Let me do some checking and see if there are some good answers to satisfy our minds and our souls. And so I went out and I began to do some research and guess what I found? There was a solid answer to every single objection he had raised with me that night. Every single one of them, I was able to find um, resolution and, and, and information and data and evidence that provided a solid answer to what he was asking. And I was able to go back to him ultimately and say, here's the response to the questions that you would ask me. And two things happened to me as a result. Number one, my faith was built even stronger. Because every time I've pushed back against it, every time I've, I, I, I've felt spiritual vertigo, and every time I've, I, I've gone in and I've investigated, I've always found there's an answer to satisfy my soul. That's the first thing it did. Second thing it did, it equipped me. Because now, when anybody asks any of these questions that that scientist asked me all those many years ago, and they have through the years, people have raised the same kind of questions. Now I've got an answer ready. You know, 1 Peter 3.15 tells all Christians, always be prepared with an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the faith that you have and do it gently and respectfully. So there's a lot. And, and if you're wrestling with a, a specific question, you know, remember I said, write it down, get, is, crystallize it, get it as specific as you can. There's so many books these days available to help you get resolution of these issues. My good friend, Mark Middleberg, uh, has written a wonderful book called uh, Questions Christians Hope No One Will Ask with Answers. <laughs> That's a great book. Um, uh, Rebecca McLaughlin wrote a terrific book called Confronting Christianity, where she looks at 12 of the big objections that people raise to the Christian, Christian faith. I ended up writing a book where I went around and interviewed scholars about the top eight objections that people raise about the Christian faith. I did a book called The Case for Faith. Uh, so there's a lot of resources out there that you can uh, check into um, uh, to get resolution of questions when they come up. You're probably not the first person to raise whatever issue it is that's been pestering you. So, friends, the key to all this is our faith in Jesus Christ is well-placed. It is well-placed, and it can withstand even the most difficult challenges. In fact, the most difficult challenge against Christianity, the biggest objection to Christianity, the number one reason why people develop doubts is this, if God is real, why is there so much suffering in the world? And people generally raise it because they themselves are going through tough times. They themselves are suffering. I did a, I commissioned a national survey that showed that this is the number one question, number one objection, number one source of doubt that there is. And I get it, I get it. You know, we, we all, have gone through suffering to one degree or the other. You know, my wife has a neuromuscular condition that's incurable. She's been in pain every day for the last 20 years, and she'll be in pain every day for the rest of her life unless God does a miracle, which he hasn't done. So this is a personal issue to us, and it may be a personal issue to you. And so next week, the second part of the series, I'm going to address that number one doubt about the faith, that number one objection. If there's a loving God, why do we suffer? And so I encourage you, if, if this is an issue in your life, or if you know someone who's going through this, bring them next week. Let's wrestle through this together and see if we can not come to some resolution that will, in the end, actually strengthen our faith. And in the meantime, if you begin to doubt, then do this. Have faith, F-A-I-T-H and see if that helps. Let me pray. Father, thank you that there are answers to the questions that we ask. Thank you that you don't recoil when we come to you with doubts and with questions. But you are a loving God, and you will guide us and nurture us through that experience. And then in the end, we pray that we might emerge stronger than ever in our faith. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your compassion. But most of all, thank you that you're real. Thank you this isn't make-believe. Thank you this isn't just um, an idea 
but you are God. We love you, we worship you, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our forgiver and our leader and our very best friend. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you.